Okay, um, we're in the last segment and uh, we have a little extra time, so uh, I thought I would just throw a few slides and talk a little bit about structured settlement underwriting before our featured speaker, uh, Dr. Uh, Barbara Senatori. But I think uh, it's an interesting area um, because it's such a, a, a contrast to, to life settlement underwriting. So uh, for us at least, it, it's, it's been uh, quite interesting. So I've just got a short presentation to uh, kind of go over our experience. Um, between 2007 and 2010, we had underwritten uh, 880 files. Um, and for these files, our underwriting was primarily based on paramedical exams. As you know, in life settlements, we like to see medical records uh, because for rich seniors, uh, you get a wealth of information. Uh, but the uh, structured settlement demographic, those who are taking structured settlements and selling them as a secondary transaction, uh, the demographic is somewhat different and typically they don't go to doctors regularly, uh, so APSs don't provide the same quality information. And so for these, the initial clients we worked for, uh, there were paramedical exams. But the problem with paramedical exams is that they're very limited in the information they present. You learn uh, about results from blood and urine samples, but you really don't get the kind of medical information that you get from an attending physician statement or the type of medical information that's pertinent, pertinent to this demographic. And I'll talk a little bit more about that a little bit later, but the results were, if, if people thought our life expectancy estimates were too long for life settlements, wow, I hate to admit how long they were uh, for the initial batch of cases we did for structured settlements. Um, we did a preliminary analysis based on 2007 through 2009, and we had 16 deaths versus expected deaths of only four. Now, this is far too small of a sample uh, to normally use, but in our judgment, when we analyzed the quality of the information we were getting, the demographic we were dealing with, and the likelihood that we in fact were too long, we felt that this was enough to make changes, and so we did. We developed in the fourth quarter of 2010 more aggressive mortality tables. Uh, we also uh, 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 debited more aggressively. And then most importantly, in the first quarter of 2012, we developed a new underwriting protocol that I think well suits this demographic and this type of business. This just shows uh, uh, our structured settlement table versus our prior table, and you can see that from age 25 to 65, the table had the effect of reducing uh, life expectancies depending on age between five and 10%. This just shows the difference in our debiting. For the earlier period, the median mortality rating uh, in, in, in the structured settlement cases we did uh, was 140%, the 90th percentile was 300%. Largely this was because we just weren't given the relevant medical information and so therefore we were underestimating uh, or overestimating life expectancy. You can contrast that with the first three quarters of 2012 and the median uh, mortality rating is 215%, the 90th percentile is 400%. In our scheme of, of things, this is a, a, a high mortality rating. Um, for life settlement business, our view is that the mortality rating is really in the 125% uh, range, somewhere between 100 and 200%. But our view has been that much of the life settlement business has had mortality ratings that are significantly too high uh, and life expectancies that have been too short. So this is just by way of saying for this demographic, at least in our judgment, we think the mortality ratings are significantly higher, and, and for us, th these are high mortality ratings. The new protocol we developed uh, tried to take into account 
uh, the fact that medical records really don't help you with people who have fallen off of scaffolding and broken their back, uh, who've been, uh, suffered traumatic brain injuries, um, who have backgrounds uh, that are generally uh, less, if you will, than population mortality, uh, or worse, greater than population mortality. So getting APSs makes the underwriting process longer, it costs money, and when you deal with people who don't have regular doctors, it generally doesn't produce good underwriting information. So what we did was we looked over our database and we analyzed the types of impairments that we would see in the structured settlement universe. And we developed a questionnaire specific to that. So for example, one of the questions on our structured settlement underwriting questionnaire is, have you ever suffered a gunshot wound? Well, I, I dare say I've never seen a life insurance questionnaire that asked whether or not you've suffered a gunshot wound. But in this demographic, it's a non-trivial percentage. A lot of people have. And we ask, have you done prison time? And we have more granular questions to see how long, what they were convicted for, and so forth. But by analyzing the cases we had seen, we were able, I think, to develop a questionnaire specific uh, to identify impairments and conditions that are typical in this market. And anytime you have a questionnaire, it's always better to have specific questions. If you have general questions, they, ge they don't hold up as well. So the, the, the basket approach for questionnaires does not work as well as when you can ask somebody if they have a specific condition. What we found is by using prescription reports, uh, we could capture uh, use of opioids, which is very common in this population, and other drugs that they might not disclose in the questionnaire. And then by selective use of telephone interviews, we could query them on discrepancies between what they revealed in the questionnaire and between what the prescription drug report indicated. So our feeling is this underwriting protocol for this demographic gets us the best information at a reasonable underwriting cost and also in a relatively timely fashion. Just a few summary statistics uh, uh, from our database. The average age in the life settlement uh, universe is 78, whereas in structured settlement universe it's 46. The percentage smokers in life settlements is 3% versus 41% in the structured settlement universe. Now that 41% compares with 21 or 22% in the overall US population. So once again, it's just another indicator that mortality in this space is even worse than the general population. But it doesn't mean we can't do a good job in, in underwriting it. There's very good un information available on a lot of the uh, injuries and conditions we see. I'm going to talk just briefly about spinal cord injuries, traumatic brain injuries, and incarceration. The National Spinal Cord uh, Statistical Center has a database of over 140,000 files with tremendously good information. Detailed life expectancy data broken down by age at injury and also broken down by the relevant characteristics of their injury. We use the Swiss Re manual, uh, which has some very good information on comorbidities for spinal cord uh, and similar injuries, such as urinary, urinary tract infections and renal insufficiency. This just shows the, the range of, uh, it shows why data-based analysis is so important. But if you look at age 45, uh, someone who's suffered a spinal cord injury, but who is motor functional, has a life expectancy of 29.7 years, to the other extreme of someone who's ventilator dependent, having a life expectancy of only 5.4 years. So what do we look like? What do we look for? We look for respiratory function, functional status, which 
is a very, very, very important marker here. And then, of course, we look for, are they quadriplegic or paraplegic? Paraplegic meaning no, no use of two limbs, but you know, they can use their arms, get around. Whereas the quadriplegics would typically have no use of any limbs. And then we, it's broken down further by which part of the spine is, is injured. So with, with good information, we can be very, very precise in the life expectancies that we come up with for these types of impairments. And then when we throw in the additional information on their uh, uh, functional status, on, on uh, uh, whether or not they've had urinary tract infections, whether their renal function is unimpaired, these help us refine the estimates even further. Traumatic brain injury, we see a fair amount of this as well. And once again, functional status plays a hugely important role. And, and Dr. Senatori, when she talks about cerebrovascular disease, will present some very interesting slides as to cerebrovascular and functional status. But we can see overall those who can't walk have a mortality rating of 660% where those who can even walk 10 feet have a mortality rating of 196%. So a huge difference for traumatic brain injured victims as to whether or not simply they can walk. Incarceration, this one's fascinating. Length of time since, since uh, you got out is, is huge. Overall, uh, in an in incarcerated population, the relative mortality is 350%. But for those within uh, two weeks of re uh, release, it's over 1,000%, whereas those for more than five weeks is 320%. Just fascinating. Now, a lot of the mortality comes from the fact that a lot of the prison population are drug dependent. And what happens a lot of times is they go into to prison, they can't get their drugs. The first thing they do when they get out is shoot up, and then they have an overdose. So we can see the, the leading causes of death, drug overdose, 23%, Home, homicide or suicide, this is, after all, a prison population, 21%, and cardiovascular, 13%. I put that down because if you were to look at uh, the percentage of deaths in, in the life settlement population from cardiovascular, it would likely be greater than 25%. So real big difference in the types of things that are wrong. Underwriting, the idea is to is to get the information that's pertinent to the population you're dealing with. When we look at those who've been in prison, the parameters we, we look at are length of time in prison, the longer, the worse, uh, or, or length of time since release, rather, the shorter, the worse, number of years in prison, the longer, the worse, nature of the crime, was it a violent crime, was it drug-related, or was it somebody who just, you know, had, had four... Uh, uh, speeding tickets and, or, 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 and a DUI and, and uh, got rude to the judge. Uh, and uh, if the person is still incarcerated, we won't quote because we know the mortality uh, possibilities are so high. So that's the deal. Uh, it's really an interesting area. Uh, we may do more on it at, at our conference next year, but it's something that I've been uh, working on, so I wanted to uh, throw them out there. And if there are any questions, uh, I'd be happy to... Uh, uh, take them. How do you get comfortable that the information, the answers are correct? That the answers are co correct? Not truthful. Well, um, two ways. One, the, the prescription uh, drug checks uh, are very helpful, and then telephone questionnaires by skilled underwriters who have looked at the file, not, not just a, a, a shop you outsource to, uh, are, are quite good at bringing information uh, from the person. Um, uh, we've also seen cases before sometimes we'll, we'll get the same person twice, and if so, we can ask them about conditions we know that they have, uh, but they haven't admitted to. But we find that for this population, unlike the, the life settlement population where you know what's wrong with the people, you know what drugs they're taking, uh, by doing prescription drug checks, we get a lot of good information. Now, you'll never get all the information, and that's a pricing issue. The considerations here, the amounts of these settlements, are a lot less than life settlements. So in terms of developing a smart underwriting program, you don't necessarily want to capture 
of what's wrong with them. If you can, through a targeted questionnaire and pre prescription drug checks and phone interviews, you know, capture 80 or 85 percent, you build a margin in your pricing and, and, and you can, I think, invest very smartly in, in this asset. Is, is that at all responsive? And I was just wondering if the prisoner basically can lie to make more money, why wouldn't he do it? People will lie to, 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 to make more money without, without question, but, but that's why we, we've inserted the drug, prescription drug checks into this process. They can't lie about that. And it turns up a lot of people. We see a lot of you know, oxycodone, and, 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 and when we see you know, p multiple, multiple drugs, we, we, we take that into consideration. Now, that doesn't capture 100%, but it captures a large percent. Most of the big drug chains participate in these prescription drug check, check programs. So we think we get a, a large percentage of the drugs they're taking, although we know in some cases we don't get it all. Eric. Are you seeing uh, this experience for the structured settlement market, and does this have any implication for the uh, traditional life settlement space? I don't know that it has an implication for the traditional life settlement space unless you know, some sort of aggregator would want to combine uh, structured settlement assets with, with life settlement assets and, uh, you know, and have some sort of blended product. But generally speaking, I think they're two different populations, um, interesting, but, but not really that related.